six or seven percent of America. They own a fairly good slice of America. Wow. And most of that money goes into the great blue chip companies. You, uh, Citigroup, Citibank is, is the largest stockholder as a Saudi. Uh, AOL, Time Warner has, has big Saudi investors. So I read where like the Saudis have a trillion dollars in, in our banks of their money. What would happen if like one day we just pulled that trillion dollars out? A trillion dollars? That would be an enormous blow to the economy. Right, right. Mr. Yeah, sure. How are you doing? Yeah, good. How are you doing? Kimball, Secret hey. Service, how are you, oh, doing, how are you doing, sir? Yes. Uh, we're just ascertaining information regarding. Oh, are you doing okay. a documentary regarding yes. the Saudi Arabia embassy uh, or chancery? Uh, no, uh, I am doing a documentary, okay. and part of it is about Saudi Arabia. Even though we were nowhere near the White House, for some reason the Secret Service had shown up to ask us what we were doing standing across the street from the Saudi embassy. Here to cause any trouble or anything, okay. and uh, you know, is that? No, that's fine. We just wanted to make sure, we just wanted to get some information as far as actually what was actually what, what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realize the Secret Service guards uh, foreign embassies. Uh, not usually, no, sir. No, no. Do they give you any trouble, Saudis? Uh, no comment on that, uh, sir. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll take that as a yes. All right, good. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks for the work. It turns out that Saudi Prince Bandar is perhaps the best protected ambassador in the U.S. The U.S. State Department provides him with a six man security detail. Considering how he and his family and the Saudi elite own 7% of America, it's probably not a bad idea. Prince Bandar was so close to the Bushes, they considered him a member of the family, and they even had a nickname for him, Bandar Bush. Two nights after September 11th, George Bush invited Bandar Bush over to the White House for a private dinner and a talk. Even though bin Laden was a Saudi, and Saudi money had funded Al-Qaeda, and 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudis. Here was the Saudi ambassador casually dining with the president on September 13th. What were they talking about? Were they commiserating or comparing notes? Why would Bandar's government block American investigators from talking to the relatives of the 15 hijackers? Why would Saudi Arabia become reluctant to freeze the hijackers' assets? The two of them walked out on the Truman balcony so that Bandar could smoke a cigar and have a drink. In the distance, across the Potomac, was the Pentagon, partially in ruins. I wonder if Mr. Bush told Prince Bandar not to worry, because he already had a plan in motion. You come in September 12th, ready to plot what response we take to Al-Qaeda. Let me talk to the, about the response that you got from top administration officials. On that day, what did the president say to you? The president, in a very intimidating way, left us, me and my staff, with the, the clear indication that he wanted us to come back with the word that there was an Iraqi hand behind 9-11 because they had been planning to do something about Iraq from before the time they came into office. Did he ask about any other nations no, other than Iraq? No, no, no. No, not at all. It was Iraq, Saddam, find out, get back to me. And were his questions more about Iraq than about Al-Qaeda? Absolutely. Absolutely. He didn't ask me about Al-Qaeda. And the reaction you got that day from the Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, from his assistant, Paul Wolfowitz? Well, Donald Rumsfeld said, uh, when we talked about bombing the Al-Qaeda infrastructure in Afghanistan, he said, there were no good targets in Afghanistan. Let's bomb Iraq. And we said, but Iraq had nothing to do with this. And that didn't seem to make much difference. And the reason they had to do Afghanistan first was it was obvious that Al-Qaeda had attacked us, and it was obvious that Al-Qaeda was in Afghanistan. The American people wouldn't have stood by if we had done nothing on Afghanistan. The United States began bombing Afghanistan just four weeks after 9-11. Mr. Bush said he was doing so because the Taliban government of Afghanistan have been harboring bin Laden. We will smoke him out of their holes. We're going to smoke him out. Smoke him out. We'll smoke him out of his cave. Let's rush him and smoke him out. For all his tough talk, Bush really didn't do much. But what they did was slow and small. They put only 11,000 troops into Afghanistan. 
There are more police here in Manhattan, more police here in Manhattan than there are U.S. troops in Afghanistan. Basically, the president botched the response to 9-11. He should have gone right after bin Laden. The U.S. special forces didn't get into the area where bin Laden was for two months. Two months? A mass murderer who attacked the United States was given a two-month head start? Who in their right mind would do that? Anybody say nice shot? Nice shot. Hell of a shot. Or was the war in Afghanistan really about something else? Perhaps the answer was in Houston, Texas. In 1997, while George W. Bush was governor of Texas, a delegation of Taliban leaders from Afghanistan flew to Houston to meet with UNICAL executives to discuss the building of a pipeline through Afghanistan, bringing natural gas from the Caspian Sea. And who got a Caspian Sea drilling contract the same day UNICAL signed the pipeline deal? A company headed by a man named Dick Cheney, Halliburton. From the point of view of the U.S. government, this was kind of a magic pipeline um, because it could serve so many purposes. And who else stood to benefit from the pipeline? Bush's number one campaign contributor, Kenneth Lay, and the good people of Enron. Only the British press covered this trip. Then in 2001, just five and a half months before 9-11, the Bush administration welcomed a special Taliban envoy to tour the United States to help improve the image of the Taliban government. You have imprisoned the women. It's a horror, let me tell you. And I'm really sorry to your husband. He met have a very difficult time with you. Here is the Taliban official visiting our State Department to meet with U.S. officials. Why on earth would the Bush administration allow a Taliban leader to visit the United States knowing that the Taliban were harboring the man who bombed the USS Cole and our African embassies? Well, I guess 9-11 put a stop to that. When the invasion of Afghanistan was complete, we installed its new president, Hamid Karzai. Who was Hamid Karzai? He was a former advisor to UNICAL. Bush also appointed as our envoy to Afghanistan, Zalmay Khalizad, who was also a former UNICAL advisor. I guess you can probably see where this is leading. Faster than you can say black gold, Texas tea, Afghanistan signed an agreement with their neighboring countries to build a pipeline through Afghanistan carrying natural gas from the Caspian Sea. Oh, and the Taliban? Well, they mostly got away. As did Osama bin Laden and most of Al-Qaeda. Terror is bigger than one person. And uh, he's just, he's, 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 a, he's a person who's now been marginalized. So I, I don't know where he is, nor do, you know, I just don't spend that much time on him, I'll be honest with you. Didn't spend much time on him? What kind of president was he? I'm a war president. I make decisions here in the Oval Office uh, in foreign policy matters with war on my mind. With the war in Afghanistan over and bin Laden forgotten, the war president had a new target. The American people. We've got an unusual terror warning from the feds to tell you about. Fox News has obtained an FBI bulletin that warns terrorists could use pen guns, just like in James Bond, filled with poison as weapons. Good evening, everyone. America is on high alert tonight, just four days before Christmas. A possible terror threat as bad as or worse than 9-11. But where? How? There's nothing specific to report. Be on the lookout for model airplanes packed with explosives. And the FBI is warning ferries may be considered particularly at risk for hijacking. Could these cattle be a target for terrorists? Fear works. Fear does work. Yes. You can make people do anything if they're afraid. And how do you make them afraid? Well, you make them afraid by creating an aura of endless threat. They played us like an organ. They raised the, the orange, and then up to red, and then they dropped it back to orange. I mean, they, they gave these mixed messages which were crazy making. The world has changed after September the 11th. It's changed because we're no longer safe. Fly and enjoy America's great uh, destination spots. 
We have entered what may very well prove to be the most dangerous security environment the world's known. Take your families and enjoy life. Terrorists are doing everything they can to gain even deadlier means of striking us. Get down to Disney World in Florida. It's like a training a dog. You tell them sit down and you tell them to roll over at the same time. Dog doesn't know what to do. Well, the American people are being treated like that. It was really very, very skillfully and, and, and ugly in, in what they did. We must stop the terror. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. All right. They will continue, in my view, uh, as long as this administration is in charge of every once in a while stimulating everybody to be afraid, just in case you forgot. It's not going to go down to green or blue. It's never going to get there. There clearly is no way that anyone can live constantly on edge like that. The harsh reality facing American families today is that they're not as safe as they used to be. Drug dealers and users looking for their next fix. Gangs who roam the streets in search of their next victim. And the growing threat of terrorists means the need for protection is ever greater. And now, that protection is here. Zytec Engineering LLC has developed and tested a safe room, finally affordable to the average American citizen. The kind of protection formerly obtainable only by the wealthy or powerful. Heck, you can be sitting in here drinking your finest Bordeaux and enjoying life while chaos is erupting outside. Every family in America should prepare uh, itself for a terrorist attack. Now to escaping from a skyscraper. John Rivers is the CEO of the Executive Shoot Corporation. Good morning to you, John. Good morning, Matt. Tell me about the product you're bringing to the market. It's a uh, emergency escape chute. It's an option of last resort. How high do you have to be in the building for that chute to actually take effect? You only have to be on the 10th floor or above. They can put this on themselves? Right. They can put this on themselves in as easy as about 30 seconds. It's real easy to put on. It's okay. Real easy to put on, but... Uh, when you first get this chute, you're going to want to put it on and try it on a few times yourself. Jamie's having a little around. trouble then, putting that thing on, I want to mention. I mean, is this something that, that you honestly think in a moment of, of panic that someone can, can operate properly? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, this is actually, uh, Jamie's probably never put this thing on before in her life, so it's okay. Don't worry about it. It's, it's something that when you get it, you're going to want to put it on several times. Well, despite the raising of the terror alert level, residents here in Saginaw are continuing with their Christmas errands. Frances Stroik and her family do some last-minute holiday shopping, knowing that Al-Qaeda is planning to attack America. She says being in Saginaw doesn't make her feel any safer than if she was in New York City. Midland is close by. And I said, Detroit's that far, that far away. I said, they could be some of And Flint, this could be some be concerns for people around here. Well, you, you never know where they're going to head. You never know where they're going to head. But one potential target specifically mentioned by the terrorist has security officials baffled. It's tiny Tappahannock, Virginia, population 2016. Such an attack could generate widespread fear that even here in rural small-town America, no one is entirely safe. On the 6 o'clock news, there was something but a, a, a terrorist alert in Tappahannock. What did the FBI tell you? Well, they contacted me by phone, uh, basically let me know about this word, Tappahannock, and that's how it started. And their so-called chatter that they picked up, they wasn't sure Tappahannock, it is a Rappahannock County, this is the Rappahannock River. There is a Rappahannock, a place called Rappahannock, and they got it mixed up. This Tappahannock, not Rappahannock. Is there any terrorist target around here? Not that we can really think of. It can happen anywhere. We have a Walmart here. We have a oh, big yeah. spaghetti supper in here. Walmart, probably. Do you feel extra suspicious of outsiders? Oh, everybody does it. It's just something that happens. When I look at certain people, I wonder, oh my goodness, do you think they could be a terrorist? You never know what's going to happen. That's right, you never know, I mean, know what's going to happen. You're going to happen right now, you know. You never trust nobody you don't know. And even if you do know them, you really can't trust them then. From Tappahannock to Rappahannock to every town and village in America, the people were afraid. 
and they turned to their leader to protect them.